Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. Tonight, we will continue our reading of Cheerfulness Breaks In by Angela Thurkill. To Lydia's intense joy, her brother Colin was able to get 24 hours leave on the day when Mr. Keith was buried. He was well and fit and absorbed in his soldier's life, and for a moment Lydia's burden was lifted. Of his future movements, he gave Lydia no information, for he had none. Lydia asked if he had heard of Noel, but he had dropped out of touch with many old friends, Noel among them. There could be no grand opening of the boating season this year, so they took the punt up to Parsley Island and laughed at remembering the picnic there when Rose Burkett had taken Knowles and Everard's coats to shelter her pink dress from the thunderstorm, and Philip had been so unpleasant and communist about flowers in churches. Colin had to go back the same evening. Lydia sat with her mother till Nurse Chaffinch announced that her patient ought to be thinking of Bedfordshire now, which she did with a brightness that only Mrs. Keith's apathy and Lydia's restrained grief kept them from resenting, though she was so good and kind and conscientious that they were really grateful to her. Lydia sat up till late, answering letters of condolence for her mother, and went to bed so tired that being young, she was able to go to sleep at once. Next day, in the full loveliness of spring, the world was told of the betrayal of a little army sent in answer to a stricken country's cry for help. Every heart was stunned by the thought of what might come, every heart was steeled to bear the very worst, and darkness covered the sun. England held her breath and was silent, waiting while the author of the betrayal slipped into black oblivion beyond human blame, beyond human compassion. Lydia, wisely considering activity the best remedy for most ills, after seeing her mother and Nurse Chaffinch, had a few words with Palmer about the silver. It had been arranged that most of it was to go to the bank for the present, a step which Palmer chose to take as a direct personal insult. Lydia accepted Palmer's notice with complete equanimity and even relief, and after putting on an overall began to turn out things in the drawing room, for it had been decided to shut it up and use the small study or library. For a couple of hours, she rolled up rugs, took the washing covers off chairs and sofas, dust-sheeted much of the furniture, wrapped china in tissue paper, and put it in a hamper to be stored in the garage. Then she turned her attention to the books. Some she proposed to put in the study, the rest she began to pack in empty cases supplied by the gardener. As always happens when one begins to finger books, she opened first one, then another, read snatches, rebuked herself, and went on with her work. And all the time, sunshine was flooding the room, and the scent of wisteria came piercingly on the light breeze through the open French window. Presently, she found an old volume of Grimm's Household Tales, which had belonged to Mrs. Keith's childhood, and had been read aloud to all the young Keiths in turn. Turning its rather battered pages, many of them loose with age and hard use, she fell completely into its charm and was reading earnestly, perched on the uncomfortable edge of a packing case, when a shadow fell on the book. She looked up and saw Noel Merton, who had come in by the French window. Lydia laid down her book, got up, and went straight to Noel's arms. Noel, hardly able to believe that his proud Lydia could lay her head so on his shoulder in peace, held her very lightly and said nothing. Then, sensitive to a faint withdrawal on her part, he let her go. Lydia, I didn't know, he said, speaking as if nothing had happened between them. I hadn't seen a paper for days, or only the cheap rags, and I never knew about your father. I ran into Roddy Wicklow in town last night, and he told me. It was pretty bad for mother, said Lydia, but Robert and Edith and Everard and Kate have been angels, and we had a, have a splendid nurse, and Colin did get down for the funeral and went on the river with me. I'm pleased to see you, Noel. Noel asked a few questions about the future of Northbridge Manor, and satisfied himself that Lydia and her mother were being quite well looked after. Then he did not quite know what to say. His Lydia looked well, though her eyes were shadowed, but he missed her uncaring arrogance, and wondered with a pang if he had bad news for her, but it had better be told. 
I came down to the deanery today, he said, not adding that he had come solely to see Lydia and give any help he could, and found Crawley and Mrs. Crawley transported with joy, though a duller thing to be joyful about I have never seen. Have you heard about Octavia? She isn't engaged to Tommy, is she? said Lydia, suddenly alive with pleasure and interest. Noel nodded with such a revulsion of relief that he could not speak. I don't want to boast, said Lydia, but I practically did it. I gave Tommy the most awful talking to that night at the deanery, and he promised he'd take Octavia for a walk next day when she came off duty. Good old Tommy, when are they to be married? Well, that part is even duller, if possible, said Noel. Needham has just heard that he can go abroad, and he and Octavia have decided that it is their duty not to get married, though for no reason at all, as far as I can see, except that it makes them both feel heroic and daisy-chainish. I think the Crawleys would have liked to see Octavia married. In fact, I know they would have, because Mrs. Crawley told me so. But, of course, they can't thrust their child into matrimony if she and her bridegroom don't want it. However, Octavia proposes to go abroad with the Red Cross, and her eyes are glistening at the thought of meeting Needham in a hospital, one mass of head wounds and abdominals. And at this they both laughed in a very unserious way, till Lydia suddenly stopped. Gosh, she said, if I loved anyone, I'd marry them at once. Then, to Noel's intense surprise, her face went bright pink, and she looked at him as if imploring forgiveness. You couldn't think of me in that light, I suppose, said Noel, because if you did, I would be more than willing, much more. For the first time since he had known Lydia, her gaze dropped before his. I thought perhaps I wasn't grown up enough for you, she said in a small, desolate voice. I mean, Mrs. Brandon and people are the sort I thought you really liked. Listen to me, my girl, said Noel, and let me tell you that I thought perhaps I was too old for you. I am ashamed to say I thought you might like Needham. Tommy, said Lydia, lifting her eyes in wonder at Noel's stupidity. And upon that she gave such a very creditable imitation of a small fit of hysterics that Noel had to hold her until her voice and body were steady again, which did not take long, for she had herself well in hand. I've always thought you were the nicest girl I knew, said Noel, and when you said in that voice that you would marry anyone you loved at once, I couldn't bear it any longer. Of course I will, said Lydia. I'll have to go on living here and looking after mother, and the place, of course, but then you'll probably be busy, and you can always come here when you get leave. We couldn't get married today, could we? I'm afraid not, said Noel, but I think we could manage it tomorrow if you like. And as for leave, I think I'll be sent abroad at any moment. That's all right, said the old Lydia. I mean, I expect you'll be much happier abroad. We'd better tell Robert and Kate, oh, and Colin. Without wasting any more time over sentiment, Lydia rang up her sister Kate, who was enchanted, and very untruthfully said she had always known it. Kate said she would get Robert and his wife to dinner, and Lydia must bring Noel. A telegram was sent to Colin, who answered with the longest and most expensive golden telegram ever sent of love, approval, and regrets that he couldn't get away. Kate had undertaken to tell the Burkitts and a few old friends. Then Palmer grudgingly came in to ask if Mr. Merton was staying for lunch. It's Captain Merton, said Lydia. Yes, he is, and we are going to be married tomorrow, so you'd better tell Cook and everyone. Come on, Noel. Mrs. Keith was staying in bed till the afternoon, so they only had Nurse Chaffinch for lunch. That excellent creature was delighted by the news and eagerly entered into the discussion as to when they should tell Mrs. Keith. It was finally decided that Lydia, who, as she pointed out, was 21, should say nothing to her mother till the marriage had taken place. Noel wondered if it was rather deceitful, but Nurse Chaffinch said so firmly that her patient would only worry if she heard of the engagement that she got her way. Noel then had to go back to Barchester. I'll come and fetch you this evening, he said from the inside of the car, and take you to Kate's. I do like your Chaffinch. She's an awfully good sort, said Lydia, and an angel with mother, even if she is a bit nursish. I know she will count on her fingers from the moment we are married and take offense if I don't engage her almost at once. I 
hadn't really considered that question yet, said Noel, wondering if he were blushing and thankful for the years of comradeship with Lydia that made her unabashed frankness so easy a thing. Babies, you mean, said Lydia, with all her old severity. Well, I hadn't really much either, she added frankly. I should think I'm more of a wife than a mother, but you never know. Anyway, we'll not bother and see what happens. Noel found nothing to say. He pressed Lydia's capable hand that lay on the door of the car and was answered by such a look of mute adoration as seriously disturbed his driving. At the Carter's house, the millennium appeared to have set in, in spite of every discouragement. Noel, who had spent the afternoon over various matters of business, some at his father's office, a solicitor, as it may be remembered, in Barsetshire, some with other authorities, was able to report that he and Lydia would be married tomorrow, and the dean insisted on performing the ceremony himself, and Mr. Needham was to be allowed to help. With Robert, he had a short talk which showed Robert that his young sister's material interests would be well cared for. Kate, who was joyful, joyfully in her element of kind fussing, said that she knew the sight of Bobby would do Mrs. Keith more, more good than anything, and that she proposed to bring him and his nurse over to Northbridge on the following day and stay there as long as Noel could get leave, so that he and Lydia would be free to go where they liked. Mrs. Brandon then rang up to say that she had to go to London for a few days to get some clothes for Delia, and would be deeply offended if Noel and Lydia didn't use stories for their honeymoon. "'You are an angel, Lavinia,' said Noel, who had taken over the call. "'Of course I am,' said Mrs. Brandon. "'That is all an old woman like myself is fit for.' "'I refuse to make any comment on that remark,' said Noel. "'Nincompoop, bless you a thousand times,' said Mrs. Brandon, and rang off." Then Mr. and Mrs. Burkett came over, full of congratulations. Mr. Burkett was preoccupied with the school measles, which were wavering between German and plain, but extremely cordial. Mrs. Burkett, not unnaturally, felt that the engagement was a peg on which to hang conversations about Geraldine, who was to be married at the end of May, all being well, and had been allowed to assist at a blood transfusion. But she was warm in her congratulations. "'Is there any news of Philip?' said Noel. None since he went abroad, said Everard. But for the moment, the shadow of the little army fighting its way stubbornly back from treachery to the friendly sea was not allowed to intrude. When Noel and Lydia left, Everard caught Noel for a moment. Have you any idea of what your movements are likely to be? He asked. I'm not being fifth columnist, but I, we'd like to know what Lydia can count on. It is three days leave, said Noel. That means, said Everard, that you have to go back the day after tomorrow. We'll take care of Lydia. Noel left Lydia at the door of Northbridge Manor. Noel, she said out of the darkness, I suppose you will have to go abroad fairly soon. The day after tomorrow, said Noel. That's all right, said Lydia, and vanished into the house. Kate was as good as her word and not only brought Bobby over, but managed so to insinuate into her mother's mind the horrible idea of Lydia's being an old maid, that Mrs. Keith said she had always been afraid when Lydia did so badly in her exams that she would never get married, and what a pity it was that Noel Merton, who was so very nice, wasn't a little younger as he might have taken an interest in Lydia. With this to work on, Kate managed to break the news that Lydia and Noel, properly married by the dean, would be back to lunch, and by this time Mrs. Keith was so sure that she had foreseen and arranged the whole thing herself that her greatest anxiety was having mislaid a very hideous set of garnets belonging to her grandmother that she wanted Lydia to have. By dint of Kate and Nurse Chaffinch's united efforts in looking in all the places where Mrs. Keith was sure the garnets were, they were at last discovered in the one place where she knew that they weren't, and she was able to welcome the married couple and was reported by Nurse Chaffinch to be standing it splendidly. I must say, said Lydia, as she and Noel, after an astoundingly good dinner, sat under the Spanish chestnut in the garden at Stories, that being married feels much the same. Only nicer, said Noel. You are much the nicest girl I ever met in my life, Lydia. In fact, perfect. It is all so nice and comfortable, said Lydia, because I know you so well. I mean, it must be rather a bore to marry someone you don't know. They mightn't be as nice as you think. Where shall we live, do you think, when you come back? I mean, when you really come back forever? We'll have to consider it, said Noel. 
Will you ring up or send me a telegram as soon as you get back to England, said Lydia. I should be so glad to know. Noel said he would. Of course, it might be a telegram to say you were dead, said Lydia, facing facts with her usual firmness. But I'd go on loving you just the same. On the next day, Noel went. Lydia came back to Northbridge Manor and took up her old way of life. Kind Kate stayed on for a time and kept Mrs. Keith from asking Lydia more than once a day if there was any news of Noel. Full spring emerged into early summer with incredible riot of blossom and leaf, while the sea before Dunkirk was covered with a thousand ships. Philip Winter returned to the Carter's house, looking aged by many years, and spent most of his time sleeping. On a hot afternoon, he bicycled over to Northbridge Manor to see Kate and Lydia. Kate was sitting on the terrace by her mother, who was better that day. Bobby was on the grass, being headed off from the flower beds by his nurse. Lydia, in a garden apron, was weeding at the other end of the terrace, for the warm days and a reduced garden staff had made weeds spring up everywhere, and it was not easy to pull them up from the sun-hardened earth. Philip sat and talked with Mrs. Keith and Kate for a little, and admired Bobby's peculiar manner of speech, unintelligible to all, but considered a masterpiece of elocution by those best qualified to judge. Everard sent you his love, Kate, said Philip, and has some good news. Mr. Bissell told him that Mr. Hopkins has been rounded up as a fifth columnist and interned. Kate, who simply had to be kind to someone, said it would be very horrid for the people Mr. Hopkins was interned with, which is perhaps the most unkind thing we have ever known her to say. Presently, Palmer, who had withdrawn her notice after the gentle Kate had spoken words of fire to her and been allowed to stay on, came out into the garden carrying a salver. It's a telegram for Miss Lydia, madam, she said. Kate and Philip exchanged glances. Please remember to say Mrs. Merton Palmer, said Kate in her best housemaster's wife's voice. Palmer meekly said she was sorry, she was sure. I'll take it to her, said Philip, as carelessly as he could, while Kate headed her mother's thoughts towards the enormity of Palmer calling Lydia, call, calling Lydia Miss Lydia. Philip walked along the terrace to where Lydia was weeding. It's a wire for you, Lydia, he said. Lydia looked up and her face was white, but she got to her feet and took off her gardening gloves. Shall I open it? said Philip, his heart beating furiously with his anxiety. No, thank you, said Lydia. I think I ought to open my own telegrams. And whatever it was, I'd love Noel just the same.